hear whether they're going to be in the tournament. So Patrick, the floor is yours. <laughs> All right, uh, can you set it up that I can share my screen, uh, make me the call oh, host? Share with him. Oh, Bremer, you're muted. Yeah, I got to, somebody's got to let me share the screen. Okay. Um, Rich? If you go to participants and you go to my name and you click more, you can make me co-host. Okay, and then I that, can do that's it. how you do it. All right. Thanks. Hang on. That's okay. I've been in enough Zoom rooms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, Bill, you've got the list of participants up? Yep, got it. Uh, Patrick, uh, yes, you should yep, be now. Now, All right, now so you are our host. And Bill Bremer, you, you can start the recording now. I did, I did do that. Okay, sounds good. All right, you should be able to see my screen. I got it. Looks like a big UFO. All right, there we go. All right, so I'm going to talk about... Um, the Milwaukee Braves, some of the reasons why they came from Boston, uh, some of the reasons why they left. Um, but to begin, to walk a little bit of background through the reason why I did this work. Um, when I was growing up, uh, my mom uh, had grown up in the Milwaukee area. Uh, her folks had built a home in New Berlin shortly after the war. And she grew up, her mom and dad would take her down to games down at Borchard Field and stuff. And so she grew up loving baseball. And she passed that love down to me. So when I was a kid and we'd go to Milwaukee Brewers games, um, you know, I'd see people talking about the old days and the ushers still wore the really, you know, the, the uh, jackets that they wore and the caps. And um, I didn't really know much about the Milwaukee Braves. And when I was seven or eight, somebody bought me a book and it had uh, greatest baseball players. I still have the book. And I remember flipping through it. There's a picture of Henry Aaron in there when he was a young man. Now, of course, I remember Henry Aaron breaking the home run record and being, you know, a middle-aged ball player. What, what floored me was he had an M on his cap. And I remember going to my mom and said, Mom, why does he got an M on his hat? And she started crying. And she said, well, that's because the team used to be here. I had never known that. So that always started kind of my fascination. So anything Milwaukee Braves growing up, I was kind of always interested in listening to. And in 1988, Bob Beagie published his book, uh, The Milwaukee Braves of Baseball Eulogy. And that's one of my go-to books. I know everybody kind of has a go-to book that, you know, they'll read, you know, every other couple of years, they'll pull out the book and just read it because you enjoy the writing or the stories, whatever. And his book was always one of mine. And I had a chance to meet him. And I said, you know, the only thing I really wanted to know was, why did they leave? It had to be more than just greedy owners. It had to be something else that the team left. And so that lit a fire under my butt. So off and on, you know, for the next, you know, several years while I was going to college and stuff, I, I thought, you know, this would really be a good dissertation project, but I got hooked up on doing some other things and the project kind of lay off to the side. And finally, I had a couple of friends that said, well, are you ever going to finish your Braves research? And it kind of lit a fire under me to say, you know what, somebody needs to tell the story. So part of the story was I reached out to Bob B again and said, look, if I finish this book, will you write the foreword? Because I, I look at this as part two of your book. His book covered the on the field stuff. Mine covered the off the field. So the focus isn't uh, in my book on, you know, Eddie Matthews and Warren Spahn and the great things they did on the field. My story really kind of deals with the reasons why the team came, what they did to be successful here in Milwaukee, ultimately what went wrong and why they left for Atlanta. So that'll kind of be what I talk about today. I'll have some pictures of some of the great uh, heroes there, but um, I was like starting with a different picture and this is the one I chose for tonight. Um, I actually got this photograph at the Milwaukee County Historical Society and I love this particular photograph of County Stadium because it looks like a UFO. <laughs> it just, it's lit up at night. You can picture going in or out of the parking lot. And you know, that's what I remember County Stadium looking like, you know, it was just, for me growing up, it was a great place to go see a ball game. There were almost, almost no bad seats in the house by the time I was a kid. I sat in every spot from the diamond box seats down there. Um, I took my mom when the Braves came back, when the Brewers went in the National League. Uh, my mom and I went to a game and I bought her tickets and I said, we're just going to go there so you can boo the Braves. Unfortunately, Greg Maddox was pitching. He pitched a great game. It was fun to watch. 
but it was cool to be there with my mom because she never really had a chance to get closure over the team leaving. And that was the first time she really did. So it was kind of a special thing, but um, you know, more on that later. So the, the story of the Milwaukee Braves obviously starts somewhere else and it starts here in Boston. And let's see if I can turn on my laser here. All right. So um, you can see this is at Braves field. You can see the owner here, Lou Perini. Now, the thing you got to understand about Lou Perini is um, he and his brothers came into the ownership uh, of the Braves in the mid to late 1940s. And he had made his money in the family business doing construction, a lot of heavy construction. Um, one of their uh, big projects later on was part of the um, St. Lawrence Seaway that their company was involved with. But he's a Boston guy through and through. I'll say this, every bit as much as Bud Selig is a Milwaukee guy. So you have to imagine when he's looking at taking a team out of Boston, um, that rips his heart out every bit as much as it would if, you know, Selig would have moved the, the Brewers to, you know, St. Petersburg or Phoenix back in the 90s when the whole debate over Miller Park was taking place. Um, I like this photograph. This is taken in 1948. If you look at the stands, they're full. Now, this is, again, is a transitional era for baseball. Um, the last team to relocate uh, was in 1903 uh, when the Baltimore Orioles moved to New York, became the Hilltoppers and later the Yankees. And then you had relative stability for the next 50 years until Boston really ran its course there. Um, but this is uh, the year that they're going to go to the World Series. They're going to lose to Bill Vax Cleveland Indians in six games. But Perini had done something very unique. Um, in this transitionary era, he agreed to televise his games. Now, you have to remember in America, having television, you know, televised games in the late 1940s, early 1950s is not like today. There were not a lot of televisions in private homes, not like we have today. I think of when, even when I was a kid growing up in the 1970s, you know, we had one main TV in our living room. Uh, we had a little black and white one that we got later on. Uh, for us kids, you know, that we could watch some stuff, but that was it. You know, in the 1940s, it was big council, small screens, and there weren't a lot of them. So a lot of times, again, particularly in the Boston area, the only place you could see the game televised was at a bar. The only advantage to being at the bar was the beer was probably cheaper than it was at the ball game. But what happened is once um, the games were televised, they saw their attendance plummet by almost 90% from the peak of 48 down to 1952, they drew le um, just over 280,000 fans, which in any year that is a disaster for attendance. Now we can sit and look at and, and try to debate, well, why is attendance so bad? Well, if you understand a couple of things about Milwaukee, when I show you the next picture, it'll make a lot of sense. This is Braves Field um, as it was utilized in the latter, um, part of the, you know, excuse me, let me rephrase this, used by the Braves since 1914, but modeled, remodeled extensively later. And this is what it would look like in configuration for 51 going into 52. Now, the reason I say, if you look at this, you kind of understand, um, look at the parking, a little bit of street parking here. Look at the parking here. Look at the parking here. Look at the park. How would you like to be that guy right there if you have to go somewhere in a hurry? So what happened is, you know, at Braves Field back in the early part of the 20th century when it was built, it was easy enough to get to. Um, you, you could take um, the trolley there, you could take public transportation, you could walk there. Um, but as society became more mobilized after World War II, people want to take their cars. And you see this with other urban stadiums. You see this at uh, Connie Mack Stadium in Philadelphia. You see it at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. Um, you even see it, you know, up at, uh, in Manhattan um, you know, up where the Giants played at the polo grounds. Um, people want to take their cars. And that was the one advantage that Milwaukee would have is that if you build a stadium out in the middle of nowhere, you can have expansive parking lots. And if you have expansive parking lots, that means you can have people park. That's an additional source of revenue, either for the team or whoever owns the stadium. So what they wanted to do to make the games a little bit more exciting, because Perini knew they had to do something. Okay, attendance was, was plummeting. So a couple of the proposals he had, what he wanted to do was move home plate and the pitcher's mound, in essence, move the whole field this way. 
to make the fences a little bit closer, to make the home runs a little bit easier. Then he wanted to raise the field and put in another section of stands back over here. So again, make it a little bit more fan friendly, et cetera. The reason he really wants to do this is because he knows there's a lot of talent coming through the farm system. The 1951 and 1952 Milwaukee Brewers will win the Little World Series. And there's a lot of players that are matriculating through that. If he can get them to Boston in 53 or 54, he thinks he can make it work. So rolling into the 53 season, there's three faces in here in particular I want to point out. Uh, we got the captain Del Crandall here who just passed away this past week. I think he was 91 years old. Um, we have Johnny Logan down here and we have, uh, I think that's Eddie Matthews on the corner there. It's hard to tell on the screen. Um, but they had talent coming through the system. And the goal was, you know, again, if he could sit and wait long enough to do that, he could. But unfortunately, as good as the team was in 52, they finished in the last place. 280,000 people means you're probably not going to make it there long term. Okay. Meanwhile, in Milwaukee, we've got a crazy little ballpark. Some of you may have been to Borchard Field. I never was there where it's located as obviously under I-43 today. Never got to see it. My grandfather spoke of it very fondly. One thing he told me was there was not a single place in there where you could sit and see all nine defenders at one time. So it was a quirky ballpark, but it was ours. It was made of wood. It periodically started on fire. Um, Bill Veck, when he bought the team, you know, he hired kids to go out there with sand buckets or water just to make sure that people smoking cigars or cigarettes didn't burn the ballpark down. Well, Bill Veck bought the team. He, of course, is the son of the former Cubs president, uh, uh, William Veck Sr. And Bill Veck is known, of course, for, for promotions. Um, when he ran the club going into World War II prior to his joining the uh, U.S. Marine Corps, um, he did a lot of different things, including once the war started, offering day games very early in the morning. So third shift workers working at the different war plants in Milwaukee would have a chance to see some baseball. Well, Vec owned the team until 46. He sold the team to an investment firm out of Chicago, who later turned around and sold it to the Boston Braves. The reason that's significant is if you own the minor league team in a given city, that means you own the rights to that city. Now, there is one exception. If that city is within an agreed upon distance from another major league franchise, of course, Milwaukee being about you know, 90 miles or so away from Chicago meant that it would take the approval of the Chicago Cubs before anything could happen. But the Cubs are run by the Wrigley family. Um, they had good connections with Bill Vack and some of the other people, and they don't really see a threat from Milwaukee. But that's something to discuss down the road. But the Brewers were doing really well. And honestly, Milwaukee was probably a pretty good AAA town. Um, a lot of good players came through playing in the Brewers organization. In fact, somebody asked me about my cap. Um, this is actually uh, what the Milwaukee Brewers wore uh, prior to the Braves even coming. Um, the Braves bought the organization in 46, like I said. Slowly, the Brewers adopted uniforms to look just like the Braves. And the hope was at some point they'd get a new stadium to play in. So in the late um, 1940s, some old plans were dusted off that were looked at all the way back in the 1920s and 30s to build a municipal stadium in Milwaukee. What would make this unique, it would be the first ballpark in the modern era built a, without a team definitely to go in it other than a minor league team, it was built with the idea the hope that maybe they could land a major league team. But more importantly, um, the idea was it was going to be built all with tax dollars. There's no team link that's going to you know buy a certain amount or, or spend a certain percentage. It's going to be all on the taxpayers. So the hardest part was finding a spot of land. So the easiest place to put it was down in the Menominee Valley. There was a place down there where they could envision some expansive parking lots, et cetera. The problem was was actually technically owned by the federal government. Federal government owned the land uh, as part of the old soldier's home up on the hill. It's been uh, refurbished, reopened, and they're doing a lot of neat stuff up there. Now, if you guys have a chance to go look at it. But that was technically part of that parcel of land. So it took an act of Congress and a signature by Harry S. Truman to allocate not only the land, but also the necessary materials to build County Stadium. With the ballpark scheduled to open in 1953, it created a little bit of pressure in the background. 
there was a lot of people who felt among the movers and shakers in Milwaukee County, particularly their business community, that you should do anything you can to get a major league team in there so that it does not have a minor league feel to it. That way, if you ever, ever have a chance to get a major league baseball team down the road, they can't ever say, well, it's a minor league ballpark. Okay. We saw other towns that had minor league ballparks that converted for major league baseball. Uh, it didn't last long. The Philadelphia athletics uh, went to Kansas city. They played in a converted uh, municipal or smaller municipal stadium uh, built for minor league ball. Uh, it didn't last long. Eventually they left for Oakland. We know the Seattle pilots played in, in old six stadium, which was the home of the Seattle Rainiers for years. Um, same thing happened. It just, it wasn't built for major league baseball and it wasn't able to sustain it. So what do you do when it looks like Milwaukee County Stadium is going to be open and you don't have a major league tenant? You're looking for one. So there's two things that really kind of happened in 52. The ownership group of the St. Louis Cardinals was forced to sell their team. The owner of the club uh, was involved in some things that were a little bit sketchy according to the rules of the National League and Major League Baseball, and he was going to be forced to sell the team. They weren't getting a lot of luck finding local ownership groups. So Fred Miller, the president of the Miller Brewing Company, went down and started negotiating with the ownership group of the Cardinals to purchase the Cardinals and bring them to Milwaukee to play starting in 1953. This lit a fire under August Bush, who felt it would be a terrible thing for not only the Cardinals to leave, but to be bought out by a rival brewery company and you know move. So he stepped up, the Bush family bought the, bought the team, course there's still an ownership um, of the Cardinals to some degree to this day um, that left the Browns you know, there's a great story with the Browns most of you probably know um, they were one of the charter members of the American League they started out in 1901 as the Milwaukee Brewers playing at Borchard Field they lasted one year and they left moved to St. Louis became the Browns for the next 50 years, they were a debacle. Um, you know, they said this about the Washington Senators. You know, they were first in first in the hearts and minds of the people. You know, but last in the you know, Washington was last in the uh, American League. Same thing could be said about C uh, the excuse me the um, St. Louis Browns. They were always last place, bottom dweller, second half of the division, whatever you want, however you want to phrase it except for one fluke year in 1944, they won the pennant. They won the pennant. Um, they played the Cardinals in the World Series. They lost the World Series. It was the only pennant they ever had. They were playing in their own park, Sportsman's Park, that they leased actually to the Cardinals. And the Cardinals were out drawing them in their own ballpark. Well, the ownership group of the Browns came up for sale after the Cardinals deal fell through. Fred Miller put a bid in on it. And unfortunately for Miller, he got outbid by America's favorite con man, Bill Vack. Now, Bill Vack never seemed to have two nickels to rub together, yet he always seemed to be able to put together a group to purchase a major league club. He was hated by his fellow owners, but what he did really well was understood the dynamics of a team, what it would take to market it, make the team more valuable, turn around, sell it down the road. That's kind of what his thing was. He did that in Cleveland. He's going to do it with St. Louis. He's going to do it again when he buys the White Sox. He'll do it again when he buys them later on. His goal was always to just simply be an ownership group. Well, he had owned the Milwaukee Brewers. He knew Milwaukee was a good baseball town. He knew Milwaukee was building a new municipal park. So what he thought to do was if he could get the ownership group of the Browns, he could buy the team eventually, maybe perhaps move them somewhere else, including Milwaukee. So he outbid Fred Miller. The irony is Fred Miller and Bill Veck had been friends going back to the day because Miller Brewing was the radio sponsor and later television sponsor of the minor league brewers when Bill Veck owned the team. So Miller felt that it was personal that one of his friends, one of his former colleagues kind of outsold him and he never really got over that. So going into the 52 season and coming out of it, Bill Veck realized the Browns were in dire straits. So going into spring training in 1953, he makes the offer to move his club to Milwaukee. Of course, Milwaukee business community and public and civic officials are jumping all over this because, you know, former local hero, Bill Vack, 
is offering to move to a team to Milwaukee and bring Major League Baseball. And I'll, I'll say, I mean, we had the one year back in 19, but this is it. This is really Major League Baseball in 1953. You could have it. It's not a good team. It's, I mean, there's a reason why it's going to move, but at least it's Major League Baseball. So local business community got behind it. They go out there and they're, they're really pushing it. The problem is the Braves have the rights to the town. So Vec offers to buy the Milwaukee Brewers Club out from under the Boston Braves. They offer to pay them more than what the team is worth and also transfer custody of the Toledo area to the Braves so they can still have a AAA organization in town and a ballpark that they can have. And just all we need you to do is just clear out of Milwaukee. And Lou Perini says no. Now, Lou Perini really, I'll be honest with you, there's a couple ways you could look at him. You can look at him as part of a hero of the Milwaukee story because ultimately he'll bring the, bring the Braves here. You can also look at him as part of the reason why the Braves are ultimately going to leave. Um, again, if you remember what I said in the beginning of my talk, you know, he's a, he's a Boston guy through and through. He wants to be in Boston. He wants his team to be there and to thrive. Well, when push comes to shove, when the story gets out, he realizes that Bill Vec has got some momentum on his side. And there's a lot of people in Wisconsin saying, hey, let's make this happen. Now, the problem for Bill Vec is the American League owners hate him. There's no way they're going to approve the move. Even if, I'll tell you, even if Lou Perini says, I'll sell you the territory, American League owners are not going to approve the move by Bill Vec. But they would approve the move if Vec would sell it to somebody else. So what do you do if you're Lou Perini? You're hoping to make it work in Boston one more time. You're looking at this. You're looking at the numbers, 280,000 people. The decision he makes is something he had been thinking about for a while. When the National League refused to help him fund improvements at Braves Field, and they refused to really seem to understand the dynamics in Boston, he went to his owners and said, I'd like to move my team to Milwaukee. Now, it passes unanimously. Phil Wrigley, uh, owner of the uh, Cubs, uh, gave his approval. He felt it was the right thing to do. And I'll say this about Phil Wrigley. Um, as long as there's owners that wanted to move in the National League, he was willing to vote for him because he always argued that they know what's in the best interest of their club. So with that, the whole issue of being too close to Chicago was taken off the map. The territory is now cleared for the Braves to move. The man most responsible behind the scenes, of course, is here, Fred Miller. Now, um, this was hard for me, and most of you probably know the story of Fred Miller. Um, when I was writing the book, uh, my son read a couple chapters, and as he was going through, he said to me, he goes, Dad, really like Fred Miller. How come he didn't buy the club? I'm thinking, well, do I tell him what happens, or do I let him read it and find out for himself? <laughs> you know, um, but Fred Miller um, is so important to Wisconsin in so many different ways. Um, he's legitimately in the College Football Hall of Fame. He played for uh, Notre Dame. He played for Newt Rockney. Um, of course, you know, he, he ran Miller Brewing Company, but he was instrumental in saving the Packers in the 1950s when they needed an extra source of revenue. He brought Miller Brewing up there to be the title sponsor of the Green Bay Packers. It was the first beer sponsorship, I believe, in the National Football League. Um, he was later put on the Packers Board of Directors. Um, he was instrumental in using the way to Miller Brewing to help advertise again to keep the Milwaukee Brewers solvent to the point that they could build a minor league ballpark, again, ostensibly for them, but it would later turn out to be Milwaukee County Stadium. Fred Miller was the mover and shaker. He was the one who personally went to Perini's house and said, look, you know, you got to do this. You know, you're not going to make it here in Boston. When people even hear you're talking about moving the team, they're not going to come to your games you're going to be in a worse situation. If you come to Milwaukee, you will be treated well. And reluctantly, Perini agrees to do this. What's the appeal? This, Milwaukee County Stadium. Now, I have different members in Milwaukee County Stadium than what this looks like. You can see uh, how abbreviated it is down the lines. There was to be temporary stands moved into the outfield areas. Uh, the lower grandstand sections, particularly in the bottom area, were actually fold-up seats when it was first to be open. These bleachers were designed to go out and set up on the field uh, for football games. So when the Packers came, uh, there certainly could be football there. They did not realize how quickly the team would become successful to the point that there would be multiple expansion plans 
um, almost immediately approved to expand the seating there because the team, uh, when it came, certainly outsold what the minor league brewers were going to do. And long term, it was hoped that, you know, again, we could get a good attendance number um, and they kept setting records. And I'll deal with that a little bit down the road. So this is what it was hoped. But if you remember that picture I showed you of Braves Field, remember where all the cars are parked in the parking lot and you got them stacked six, seven deep in some of the places. Again, what's the beauty of this? We take it for granted out here, right? You can drive to the ballpark. You can leave when you want. You might get stuck in traffic leaving, but you're not getting stuck in traffic trying to get out of the parking lot right so stadium is built this is one of my favorite shots from milwaukee county stadium it's from 1953 you can see that um, actually i think this is 54 um, now that you look at it uh, you can see where they built in some temporary extensions here uh, for stands but this is all basically temporary bleachers it's gravel down there there's a lot of mosquitoes and crap that they had there garbage would collect under the stands but it was this basic cyclone fence across People would sit right up to the line. You could see right into the ballpark. What a great view um, of the stadium. You can see the lighting up here. Lighting actually had to be changed from what was originally built in there before the Braves agreed to come. The Milwaukee County Board had agreed to put in better, brighter lights uh, at County Stadium. So that was done. They did actually about $2 million worth of improvements uh, from a brand new stadium just to get the Braves to come. So when the negotiations were happening, the Braves sent people out, they looked at the ballpark, they put their list of things together. We want office space, we need this, we need that. The county board agreed to it, boom, it gets done. The Braves come and we've got baseball in Milwaukee and you had crowds like this it seemed every day, okay? Well, it was hard not to be excited when you look at some of the talent that you had. Um, again, I love this picture. You got uh, Hooks, you got Warren Spahn here. You got uh, Jolly, uh, Charlie Grimm, uh, Grimm rather. And you got Eddie Matthews. Matthews is my mom's favorite player of all time. Um, I, I always say this whenever I talk about it. The, the thing that always still bothers me uh, when I think about the Braves, they had a statue for Warren Spahn in Atlanta. We don't have one in Milwaukee. Um, he's the winningest left-handed pitcher of all time in Major League Baseball. His glory years were in Milwaukee. He threw two no, -hitter, no hitters at Milwaukee County Stadium. Um, I would love to have a statue of Warren Spahn somewhere out in Milwaukee. I don't know if the Brewers will ever do it because they already got one of Henry Aaron in a Braves uniform. I don't think they want to have a second Braves out there before they have some more Brewers ones, but here's to hoping because it, honestly, if ever there was a place for a Warren Spahn statue, it's here in Milwaukee where he had his glory years. But um, the club adopted, you know, the, the minor league Brewers cap and it became the look for them. Um, I always like to point this out when you look at pictures, if you look very carefully at the M's on their caps, almost all of them are different. Uh, they had multiple team uh, companies that made caps. <clears throat> some of the M's were sewn on, some of them were embroidered. Um, they always look a little bit different. They really weren't standard. Even when you look at 57 and 58, every once in a while you see a different looking M. Um, so don't let it, if you have a Milwaukee Braves cap, don't ever have somebody tell you that's not legit because I'm telling you, I've seen at least five different variations of the M's over my years of looking at pictures of the Braves. But this was a great lineup. But Charlie Grimm was a great choice for it. Of course, he ends up... Uh, uh, with the Cubs for a lot of years, um, but he was a, mi a minor league manager for the Brewers. He had gone up to the big club in Boston in 52. The presumption was they knew already in 52 that if Milwaukee was an area to go to, Grimm fit in really well. The Milwaukee community loved him, and the players really loved him and responded to him well. Uh, that first year in 53, uh, they went from being a last place team in 52 in Boston to being second place uh, in Milwaukee, but it was an infusion of new talent. Uh, Billy Bruton comes up. You know, has a spectacular opening day, but, you know, just just played really well. Um, a lot of the other guys that were matriculating through the process came up and just had nice years for the for the Braves. Um, one guy who also had a really nice year for the Braves in 1953, was George Webb. One of my favorite memories, you know, my grandpa always talking about George Webb and that was our place to go to and get a burger and a cup of chili. But every you know, every time I'd go into one in my era, it was, you know, George Webb predicts the Brewers were going to win. And the number changed. It was 10, it was 11 or 12, whatever. But George Webb, the owner, the guy that actually ran it, um, loved the club. He used to go down to Bradenton, Florida to see him. In fact, he was coming back, I believe, in 1956 from Bradenton. Uh, he passed away from a heart attack uh, coming home. Um, but George Webbs was always linked again to a great Milwaukee company linked to baseball in Milwaukee for a lot of years. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures in baseball. This next one, um, how can you not love Warren Spahn? 
you know, Spani became the face of the franchise, you know, for me as a historian, you know, when you think that this guy was at Remagen Bridge and only survived um, because he had to answer nature's call, uh, Mortar Round came in, killed the guys he was standing with. He was the only one that survived. We came that close to not, not ever having Warren Spani in Milwaukee. Um, but he came in and, you know, he had a, vo- uh, a high lighted career when he was in Boston. Um, they still talk about 1948, Spahn and and Pray for Rain. Uh, when they went to the World Series, but uh, it was really the highlight of his career was in Milwaukee. Uh, multiple years of winning 20 games, complete games, just was the face of the franchise for a long time. And um, he was, a, he was a, a pitcher that nobody really wanted to see, you know, when the games really mattered. Uh, but 53 uh, and 54, the Braves did much better. 55, the Dodgers ran away with it. It was their year. They win it, of course, uh, over the Yankees in, in seven games, but 56, a lot of people were thinking it was Milwaukee's year. Um, Grimm was fired during the summer. He was replaced by Fred Haney. Haney was a little bit more of a disciplinarian than Grimm was. Grimm was kind of a player's uh, manager. Um, Haney kind of cracked the whip a little bit, and they, they got close. They, they went into the weekend, last weekend of the season, with a chance to go to the World Series. Um, they dropped the last game to the Cardinals. Um, they didn't. Uh, the Dodgers went one more time which meant all eyes were on the Braves for 57. 57 was the peak year for a lot of things. It was the peak year for attendance. It was the peak year for wins. It was the peak year uh, because they're going to win the championship. You can make the argument the 1959 team was a better team than 57, but 57 is the year that they won it all. Why'd they win it all? Well, it wasn't just because of Warren Spahn. It was because of Lou Burnett. Now, you can't see it here as I'm talking to you, but Lou Burdett was one of the first Milwaukee Braves I got to meet as a child. I have an autographed picture of him sitting right here. I can pull it out. This sits in my office every day. Old Nitro Lou um, wins three games, of course, in 1957. The last one's a shutout on two, two days rest at Yankee Stadium. Um, I, what I would give to have seen the crowds on Wisconsin Avenue or in any city in southeastern Wisconsin the night the Braves won it all. Um, you can see Johnny Logan stand in the background. I cannot imagine a shortstop today would get that low before a pitch. Not really sure what he's doing. I don't know if he did that on every play, but he certainly is excited. Of course, we know the last ball comes to Eddie Matthews. Matthews puts the uh, tag on third base and it's over. Frank Torrey is jumping in the middle of the crowd right here. You can see Logan jumping in, a couple other guys coming out. It was a memorable year. And if anybody would have said to you, it's at this point that everything's going to start to go wrong, nobody would believe you. But shortly after the World Series ended, it was time for the Braves to negotiate a new stadium lease. And it was at this point that the Milwaukee County Board decided that their role was to maximize the returns they were getting out of their municipal stadium, which meant the Braves were going to have to pay more. Uh, To use the stadium, they would have less say in the price of concessions, including things like beer, um, sandwiches, whatever was sold in the ballpark. Everything had to go through the county, and it was a very acrimonious negotiations. Part of the problem was the Milwaukee County Board, in many ways, viewed County Stadium, I will say, as a Taj Mahal. They viewed it as a destination ballpark. Okay. that it's a ballpark that when you go to, you know, it's just, it's always going to be here. People love it. They didn't view it the way it really was. What was Milwaukee County Stadium? Now, I, I tell people all the time, I love going to games at County Stadium, but let's be real honest. It looked like it was designed by Soviet architects and built by East German construction crews. It was the ultimate in utilitarian. Okay. There was nothing fancy about County Stadium. In fact, before it was torn down, one of the greatest lines I ever heard about County Stadium was this. It was an old ballpark with no old ballpark charm. And I think that that pretty much is accurate. You know, I talk about the ghosts of, you know, the past at County Stadium. You know, when I would sit there, I remember sitting there with my great grandfather, who was a World War I vet. I remember him saying, yeah, you know, that that's where Eddie Matthews played over there. And, you know, Henry Aaron played out over there. And, you know, I'm a kid of, you know, eight, nine years old just taking it in because I'm at the ballpark, you know, not really appreciating what I have sitting next to me, my grandfather, who could walk me through some of this stuff. But every time I'd go there since, I would always think of that, you know, think of some of the great Packer games that were played there, some of the great games, you know, in the World Series, you know, all the Braves needed to do in 58 is win one of the last three games, you know, and they go back to back titles, you know, 59, they come within a game of winning the pennant again. But, you know, things get a little bit different. 
Now, part of the problem for the Braves in Milwaukee was this. Lou Perini, because of his experience in Boston, did not want any of the games televised. Well, mm. television is still a relatively new medium. Ironically, a lot of what we have with televised baseball today is what they kind of envisioned back in the 1950s, where you pay for a service that provides baseball. Okay. So again, I, I'm not sure how many of you have cable TV or get your games over the air, but if you stream television now, and there's a lot of people that stream television, you have to pay to have different things in there, including Major League Baseball apps, whatever the case is. This is what they envisioned that you would pay for games. Um, the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, you know, before he moved his team, you know, he envisioned that there would be a little cash box, you know, that you drop a quarter in on your television so you could watch Dodger games. And that's, you know, once a month, somebody would come around and collect the change out of your television. Well, Perini felt television was detrimental to attendance in the stands. Milwaukee County Board was terrified that televised games would also mean reduced fans in the stands, which meant reduced revenues for the county. So neither one really wants televised games. The problem is when you start to televise games, it builds interest. They didn't really grasp that. They thought it would stop people from coming to the ballpark rather than encourage people to come to the ballpark. Okay. It's a little bit different today now. Okay. Well, from 1952 to 1959, the Milwaukee Braves paced the National League. This photograph here is taken after some of the additional revenues. It's taken from April 14, 1959. You can see the expansive um, additions out here. You can see the added section here. You can see a third section of bleachers added and eventually bleachers added all the way across. It'll change the bullpen section here. If you look very carefully, you can actually see markings on the field. Um, that's actually from last fall's football games where they'd move stands out on the field. So when the Packers played at County Stadium, played three games there every year, that you know, would feel more like a football stadium than watching a football game in a baseball stadium. Um, 59 is where things started to really go south. In 1958, the Braves go back to the World Series, uh, but attendance was lower. Attendance was lower again in 59. In fact, when they made the postseason, again, postseason was always you win the pennant, you're in the World Series. Unless there's a tie, and then there would be a three-game series to determine who wins and advances. Well, they played the Dodgers. They dropped the first game. And unfortunately, they dropped the second game and they were knocked out. The story that everybody remembers is Eddie Matthews asking where the fans were. Well, part of the problem was the team had fought, had kind of really backslid as the year progressed. In fact, statistically, you can argue Fred Haney did one of the worst jobs in managing baseball of the 20th century with, the, with that 1959 team. With the talent he had, with the pitching staff he had, the fact that they even were tied at the end of the year uh, was kind of a damning testimony to him. Of course, he will get fired at the end of the year and he will be replaced by Charlie Dressen. But worse, I think, for the fans was they, they picked an odd day and time in the afternoon for the game to take place. And let's be real honest. It is hard to be always enthusiastic when your team is good every year. See, teams, when they move, they usually generated interest because it was new and it was something to do. The difference was for the Braves, when they moved to Milwaukee, they got good. So what happens is you can have a blip in attendance that stayed artificially high because the team is good, and then eventually settle back down into what a normal range would be. So when people ask, well, what do I think a normal range for attendance in Milwaukee County should have been in this era? And again, you have to understand you're drawn from all over Wisconsin, <coughs> particularly the five, five counties around it that make up the stadium district today were the counties that the, supported the Braves the most. Um, you know, I always say, you know, one point, you know, one to probably 1.5 is what you should have expected for an average attendance, which means you're probably going to dip below to somewhere seven, 800,000 some years. You're probably going to be one, five, one, six other years, but that's a realistic number. It was not realistic to go into the 1960s thinking you're going to be drawing 2 million fans a year. It is easier to be a fan of a team that's on the rise than a fan of a team that's on the decline. And this is certainly what they started to see with the Braves. The team had been really good, but slowly some of the players that had been really good get traded away. They didn't really seem to replace anybody. 
The team was good. It wasn't great. And let's be real honest, what else starts to happen in 1959? Vince Lombardi gets hired from the coaching staff of the New York Giants to take over the floundering Green Bay Packers. He turns that franchise around. Now, why is that significant? Well, if you remember 1960-61, there are two rival football leagues. Football is televised, including in color. And for the younger generation of the 1960s, by 1964, more Americans say they like football than baseball. Well, put yourselves in the average you know, fan of football, right? Professional football. Was there a better place to be than in the state of Wisconsin in the 1960s? Probably not. So you can understand what starts to happen is interest in the Braves organization as a whole goes into decline. Sports coverage that in the past have been almost solely dedicated to the Braves was starting to be a little bit more balanced to a little bit more to favor the Green Bay Packers. So as the team continued to struggle, and again, they never had a losing season. They are the only professional organization to exist in the United in American history that never had a losing season. They existed for more than 10 years, never had a losing season. Okay. But they weren't doing as well as they were in the past. Okay. So fans started to not come out in the same numbers they did before. So the numbers kind of paled off a little bit. I think by 1960, it was 900,000, um, you know, going into, nine, <coughs> excuse me, 1962, it was just under 900,000. Um, for Lou Perini, this was becoming a crisis. He had seen this happen in Boston. Remember 1948, they go to the World Series. Um, he's, he's got about 1.8 million fans that came through the turnstiles. By 1952, only four years later, he drew 280,000. So he makes a decision in 62 to get out. Now, the problem is this. Fred Miller arguably would have been in position to buy the team had he not been killed tragically in December 1954 in a plane crash. Now, it's not really clear whether Perini would have sold it to him prior to this moment or not. We know there was a local group that expressed interest. They were bypassed for another local group that had, among people on the board, their board of directors, uh, one of the nephews of Fred Miller, uh, one of the uh, heirs to the Johnson Wax uh, Company. Um, so there was a lot of people, some investment bankers, et cetera, from the Chicago area. The decision was if we sell the club to them, they might be able to handle the team and thrive with it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this picture here for a moment. Um, Lou Perini made the decision, I will argue, a little bit reluctantly. Now, I'm going to put an asterisk with this. Remember, this is Boston guy. He had told Tom Yawkey, who owned the Red Sox, you know, look, after he moved his team in Watfield, if you ever sell the Red Sox, I'm interested in buying them. I'd like to own a team in Boston again. If not Boston, I think he wanted to be on the East Coast. He was instrumental in helping um, the National League kill the Continental Baseball League in New York. It was going to be a third major league, the Continental Baseball League. Um, the National League crushed it. They took the ownership group that was going to own the New York team. And they opened up the New York Mets in 1962. There is some talk. I haven't found any evidence to it. I don't know if there is. Um, that Perini actually was in negotiations with the city of New York to move the Braves to New York after the Dodgers and the Giants left. Don't know if that's true or not. There's also rumors that he was in negotiations before he sold the team to move the club to Atlanta. Again, I don't know the veracity of that. Some people... In the know, claim that this was done with his owner, at least to look at the opportunity because he's looking at attendance numbers. He's seeing that the attendance isn't where it needs to be. Maybe we need to go somewhere else. Okay. So he agrees to sell the team. So this is Perini at the press conference. Bill Bartholomew is a young guy here. I think he's 34 years old. He and his wife had a place out in Lake Geneva. I will say this to do this um, book, to do this presentation. Um, I spent about two and a half hours on the phone with, with Bartholomew, and I will say this. Uh, he was a gentleman in asking my question, answering my questions. Um, it's very clear that some of the things that he had been asked a hundred different times, you know, he answered the same way. But he, he added some things I thought really kind of uh, made me understand the situation a little bit better. He said this, look, because I asked, right, did you buy the team to move it? 
because you buy the team in November of 62. By July of 63, there's rumors the team's going to move. Did you buy them to move it? And he said, you got to understand. He's like, my wife and I, we have a place in Lake Geneva. For us to go to a Braves game, it was a 40-minute car ride from the time we left our house to the time we were up in the president's box at County Stadium. It's like, my business is in Chicago. My kids go to school in Chicago, right? Everything I have is in Chicago. For me to go to Braves game when they're in Atlanta means I got to get on a plane. I got to fly to Atlanta. Somebody's got to pick me up, take me, you know? And he's like, it's just easier for me to be. So I thought, the more I thought about it, I'm like, you know, maybe I give him a benefit on the doubt. I don't know if he bought the team to move it. But I certainly know this. They realized fairly quickly they overpaid for the team. The price they paid was probably market value. The problem was they didn't have enough revenue to pay it down. They bought a lot of it on credit. Now, as this is going on, there's another thing you got to understand. They overpay for the team, but the Milwaukee County Board still controls the stadium. And you remember when I showed you the pictures of the big expansive lots? Remember all those cars in there? Right? Remember that? Do you know how much revenue the Braves made from all those cars? Nothing. The county got it all. The Braves still had to maintain the parking lots. They got no revenue from it. So they're looking at this long term going, we really want to be baseball owners. They had tried to buy into the Chicago White Sox. The Allen brothers did not want to turn over controlling the interest of the club to them. So when the Braves opportunity came along, they sold it. Now they desperately wanted to be baseball owners. You're not going to buy a club and then turn around six weeks later and sell it to somebody else. If you spent your young adult lifehood trying to buy a club, they want to be baseball owners. So they came up with an idea to try to help cover up the revenue streams. And that was to sell stock similar to what the Green Bay Packers had done. Sell a limited number of stock. It doesn't really do anything other than expands the ownership group. Um, it brings in some revenue dollars into the club immediately that they can use to either pay down their debt, cover some of the other things they need to do prepping for the following year. The problem was, unlike the Green Bay Packers, nobody really seemed that interested in buying this stock. So the stock sale and Bartholomew said, well, you know, I, we sold about 10,000 shares, so I didn't think it was a complete failure. Well, they wanted to sell over 100,000 shares. They sell 10,000, let's be honest, that's not really a good number. Now, you can put that on the fans if you want, but let's be real honest. What else is happening in baseball across the country? While Braves attendance is going down, baseball attendance is going down everywhere. Baseball attendance in the worst year prior to the Braves announcing they're going to leave. Attendance in Milwaukee was still higher than it was in Chicago for the Cubs. Nobody would ever say Chicago's a bad baseball town. Braves attendance was still higher than it was for the Red Sox. Nobody would say Boston's a bad baseball town. Milwaukee's going to get that reputation because Bartholomew and his group are going to start to say that very publicly. Look, you know, attendance isn't where it is. You know, we're not drawing 2.2 million a year. Well, as I've said before, it's kind of an artificially high number. See, other teams moved. After the Braves, you know, the Athletics move, um, the Browns move, they go out to Baltimore and become the Orioles. Um, you know, the Senators move out to Minnesota. Um, so teams are shifting around, but there's a reason why they move. You know why they move? They weren't really good. They weren't really drawn at home. If you move to a new market, at least you bump your attendance. That's why they move. The only exception that arguably is probably the Brooklyn Dodgers, who drew really well prior to them leaving and obviously drew really well when they got out to L.A. But you can't say Milwaukee was a bad baseball town. So what happens is, they get into a process of negotiating a new stadium lease, and it's agreed ultimately to go to a three-year lease. Now, what the Braves wanted was a, was a three-year lease that they controlled the options to extend it or not. Milwaukee County Board didn't want to go along with that, and the Milwaukee County Board did not want to have a long-term lease. Now, their logic was this. If suddenly the Braves become really good and they start drawing really well, we're going to miss all these revenue streams if we agree to a long-term deal now. So they didn't want to see a long-term deal. But I'm telling you, as sure as I'm sitting here right now, had they signed a 10-year deal in 1962, the Braves are still here in Milwaukee. They couldn't do it. Best they could agree on was a three-year deal. 63, 64, and 65 to be renegotiated down the road. Okay, 
that right there in and of itself will be the nail in the coffin of the Milwaukee Braves. They, they couldn't line up a long-term deal. So in Atlanta, hoping to land a team similar to what Milwaukee had done, they built a municipal stadium, a combination between Fulton County and the city of Atlanta. They built Fulton County Stadium with the hopes of drawing a team. Now I asked Bartholomew, hey, did you ever think about selling the team and trying to get an expansion franchise. If baseball was that hot to go to Atlanta, why didn't you try that? And his answer was because the people in Atlanta did not want an expansion team. They wanted an existing franchise. There were two teams that had stadium leases that were due um, between 64 and 65. That was the Cleveland Indians and the Milwaukee Braves. So it's gonna be one of those two teams you know, that the Atlanta people are gonna get. Now, what does Atlanta offer? Atlanta offers a seven state radio network. To this day, my daughter who lives in Cookville, Tennessee, their local radio station is part of the Atlanta Braves radio network. You got seven states across the South. You got a seven state television broadcast thing. You got to understand what that means. Coca-Cola steps up and says, we're going to pay you $5 million for broadcast rights. You don't need fans in the stands to survive in Atlanta like you do in Milwaukee because the radio broadcast offer in Milwaukee was about $500,000. This Milwaukee is landlocked. You got the Chicago teams to the South. You got the twins out to Minnesota. You got a lake to the East and you got, you know, the UP to the North. There's not a lot of people up there. You're really landlocked. Anybody in a position of ownership group realize if you look at the revenue stream available in Milwaukee versus what's available in Atlanta, I will say this. If you look at it from a business sense, you're an idiot not to go to Atlanta. And that's hard. But that's where the ownership group is going to come down to. They're going to look at what the revenue streams are. And they're going to see that. Now, a problematic for them is this. I'm going to point them out, Eugene Grabschmidt. Now, I will say this about Eugene Grabschmidt. Grabschmidt was a guy who loved representing the taxpayers. And he loved Milwaukee County. I will not doubt that. But he had an abrasive personality. And he is one of the primary reasons there was hostility between the organization and the county. Could a deal have been worked out that would have been equitable to keep the Braves here? Probably. But Grabschmidt's going to kind of stand in the way of that. So what are some of the things that could have been done? Well, a couple simple things could have been done right away. Parking lot revenue goes to the team. Give the team control over what beers are sold in the ballpark. Give the team control over, you know, what kind of concessions and prices are, right? That isn't done. So when the rumors start to come out that the Braves are going to go, the county realized finally that, oh, my Lord, we might actually lose this team. So starting after the 1963 All-Star Game, in particular for 1964, what the Braves did was put a major push to get over a million fans. Now, this is supported by the business community. It's supported by Milwaukee County. And there was a big push. I got a picture of John Doyne holding his back the Braves card. And the idea was, hey, look, if we can get people to come out to the stadium, if we can draw, you know, 1.2 million fans or more, we show that we are still a major league city and we can do it. With all the pushing, prodding, conjoling, whatever they could do, they drew less than a million. They drew about 900,000. That October, the board of directors of the Milwaukee Braves agreed to a deal believe the deal had actually been agreed to already in July, but it becomes public in October when Ernie Johnson goes in front of the cameras and said the board of the directors of the Milwaukee Braves have asked the National League to allow the team to transfer to Atlanta starting from 1965. The only leverage Milwaukee had left was the stadium lease. Stadium lease had said, um, you know, you're required to be there through 65. The question is, what do you do? Do you force the team to stay and play a lame duck year or do you let them go? What do they have a chance to go to? Take a look at this. Again, you got a brand new stadium. It's a bigger stadium than what Milwaukee County Stadium was. It also has expansive parking lots. The Braves are going to get the concession you know, choices. They can pick the beers they want to sell. They can set the price of hot dogs in the ballpark and they get a percentage of the parking lot revenue. It's a great deal, including a seven state, you know, deal you get automatic sponsorship from coca-cola there's a lot of reasons to go so what do you do see here's the thing baseball owners viewed their um teams like we view companies um 
and I'm not even going to say just baseball. I think uh, professional sports teams do. And I'll tell you kind of a side, uh, side little football story. Um, if you guys remember when the Baltimore Colts were really struggling and the ownership group there was looking to move the team somewhere else. And there was a fabled uh, press conference that the owner of the Baltimore Colts made. Um, he's coming back from Baltimore. He had been down in Phoenix negotiating to move the team down there. And he comes in and he's a little bit liquored up and he basically says, you know, look, I, I'm not going anywhere. You know, this team's not for sale. I don't know where you get the guy, you know, where you guys get these ideas that the, the team's for sale or whatever. But, you know, you gotta understand this is my team. It's not your team. It's my team. I work for it. My family works for it. It's my team. And wherever it plays, it's mine. That's the way owners looked at it. It's like a plumbing company. If you were on a plumbing company in Madison, you decide to pack up and you're going to move to Atlanta next year, nobody cares, right? Because anybody that needs a plumber, they'll find another plumber that comes. Baseball isn't that way. When you move a franchise, you're ripping the hearts out of people who are fans of that club. You're asking to build loyalty to support the team, but you're willing to turn that because baseball owners always believe this. We can always make new fans. The owner of the athletics, Charlie O'Finley, you know, he thought you ought to be able to move his team every two years, right? Go to, go to Louisville, play there for two years. Hey, look, if it doesn't work out, we'll move somewhere else. We can always make new fans. It's a sad statement, but that's the way the ownership groups look at it. So it is decided that Milwaukee County will enforce the stadium lease to make the team stay and play out in 1965. Now there's two ways to look at this, right? One is you go out and support the team because it's the last chance you might have Major League Baseball in Milwaukee. If you draw good numbers, right, you might show Major League Baseball. If they expand again, Milwaukee is worth it. Now, the Atlanta group offered money, in essence, the same, a little bit better money than what Milwaukee had made off the stadium the year before. So if you added up all the parking lot revenue, their cut of ticket sales, their cut of uh, beer sales, et cetera, if you added all that up, it was just under $200,000. They offered him $350,000. Let us go right now, clean, lock, stock, and barrel. We'll go play 65 in Atlanta. Been a good deal. End up on the good graces of baseball. Maybe, again, if Milwaukee comes up for an ownership or an um, uh, expansion chance, do you take that chance? Um, Milwaukee County Board said no. Braves came back halfway through the year, offered him $500,000. Let us go now. Lock, stock, and barrel. Let's just walk away. We can go. And, you know, play out the rest of the year, 65 again, Milwaukee County said no. This photograph um, and the, the next one are two of my favorites. Many of you guys have seen the photograph of Matthews and uh, Aaron walking up the tunnel at County Stadium after the last game. That, that picture was staged. Um, it's still a sad photograph, but this one to me, this wasn't staged. You know, you look at the fans, you look at the players here, and you just wonder what went wrong. You know, how, how is it that a team that was the number two drawing team in Major League Baseball for 13 seasons, how are they losing their team? That's September at the last game, Taps played. Um, 12,577 fans were in attendance that night. And with that, the team still had a West Coast trip to play the Dodgers yet. Um, played out another week, but the um, ownership group had to maintain a presence in County State until the last Packer game of the year was played uh, in November. Once that game was played, the moving vans showed up at County State and they packed up everything. Now, when the Braves moved into the ballpark, there were empty concession stands. So they bought the grills, the tongs, everything to make hot dogs and the tappers for the beer and stuff like that. That was none of that was provided by the county that was all bought by the Braves. So when they left, they took it all with them. So the irony is there are people in Atlanta who ate hot dogs on the same grills used at County Stadium at one point. But what I'm going to show you next is a couple of things I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind because the Braves organization still to this day, and again, they're coming into Milwaukee this weekend. Um, you will see people wearing Milwaukee Braves caps this weekend at the ballpark. Um, there's still a strong connection to the Braves. I've, even with limited attendance, the few Brewers games I've, I've turned in, I actually watch a little bit. I've seen a Braves cap in the, in the stands every time I've, I've turned a Brewers game on. But the Braves still believe, the Braves organization still says it was a lack of attendance that caused the Braves to leave. That's not really the case. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple of things. All right. You guys can see the slide okay? All right, so if you take a look at this, there's two graphs. The blue graph 
is the attendance of the Milwaukee Braves, where they came from the year before they left. So year minus one is the year before they moved, right? So that's the attendance in their first town. The second mark is the first year in their new town. So you can see the spike from 280,000 to just under 2 million in one year, okay? Braves attendance keeps going up till we get to 1957, that fifth year. And then we end up in a slow decline into the 1960s. Right here is 1963, 64. It rallies, goes back up to just under a million plummets in 65 because obviously it's a lame duck year and everybody knows they're leaving at the end of the year. The other graph is the Atlanta Braves. So again, starting at the same level here, this is 1965 Milwaukee, this is 66 Atlanta. So they picked up a million fans. But look, they never, never came close in their first 13 seasons to being close to where they had been in Milwaukee. It's only when you get right here, they barely in the 10th year get above what Milwaukee had been. They dip below it again, and then they stay consistently higher until it plummets off. And ironically, in 1975, the Atlanta Braves drew fewer fans than the Milwaukee Braves did in their lame duck year of 1965. Okay, That tells you something about attendance in Atlanta. But here's the difference. See the difference in attendance? Let's take the biggest mark gap right here. Here to here. The Atlanta Braves made more money with this number of fans than the Milwaukee Braves did with this number of fans. So the numbers just simply didn't add up on the broadcast side. The, the Atlanta Braves made more money playing in an empty stadium than they did playing in a full stadium in Milwaukee. And that's a sad legacy of the economics of baseball. So what is our legacy? What is our holdover? Well, for me, I had to throw a picture in of him my all-time favorite baseball player, Henry Aaron. To me, it is a sad legacy that, you know, he broke the record in Atlanta. Even sadder is his Hall of Fame cap has an A on it. He played for 20, I think 21 seasons, 14 of them were in Milwaukee. Should have had a block letter M on his cap. But his number is retired to both sides. He was a great, great man. Never had a chance to meet him face to face, but my favorite Henry Aaron story was shortly after he retired, they did a Hank Aaron day and I'm sitting in the lower grandstands at Milwaukee County Stadium. And I just happened to be looking up at the catwalk that went in the press box. And I see Henry Aaron walking up there. So I'm just a kid, I yell, hey, Hank, as loud as I could. He stopped, looked my direction and waved. He could have kept walking. He didn't have to acknowledge anybody sitting down there. He stopped to wave. It's a great legacy of Milwaukee baseball right there, okay? Um, I threw this photograph in. So um, my kids grew up um, in the last vestiges of County Stadium. People said, you know, well, you know, Milwaukee County Stadium could be saved. You know, you could refurbish it, put a dome on it. You could do the things that they want to do with Miller Park. Well, I'll be real honest with you. Had it not been for the construction of Miller Park, we would not have Major League Baseball in Milwaukee. We might have a minor league baseball team playing in, in County Stadium, but we would not be a major league town anymore. Um, any more than the Boston Braves are national, or, you know, Boston is a national league team anymore. Um, thank the Lord for the visionaries to build Miller Park uh, when they did. And I'm telling you sometime within the next 25 years, we are going to hear the words new stadium. It's going to happen because by 25 years out, Miller Park's already going to be 50 years old. So maybe they'll refurbish it. Maybe it's got a hundred year footprint in it like Fenway Park does. I don't know. All I know is at some point that discussion is going to happen again. What I've learned in doing all my research is this, okay? It is said, if you build it, they will come. There's an addendum to that. If you don't build it, they will leave, okay? And it, Oakland's finding that out right now as the uh, Oakland Athletics are looking to move somewhere else. Um, ironically, today, one of the towns they mentioned was Green Bay. So uh, think of that. We could have uh, two major league baseball. It won't happen. They're not going to Green Bay. But it would be fascinating to see, you know, two major league teams in the state of Wisconsin. I just, I don't know what would happen long term. But um, I have one last graph to show you. All right, so this is the last slide I'm going to have. Okay, just want to show you how this works. Okay, so if you look at the slide, this is a fan retention slide. This is one of the things I always like to point out with people so you understand something. Right? 
when people want to say Milwaukee was a bad baseball town, take a look at this. Okay. So this represents the first year. So obviously whatever your attendance was, that's where you start. So Atlanta, Milwaukee Braves and the Milwaukee Brewers, that's your first year, right? Look what happens to attendance. Okay. So this dark or excuse me, this light blue is the Milwaukee Braves. Okay. So from their initial part, they move up, they consistently move up. They finally dip below their hundred percent mark in year seven, consistently drop below till we get out to season 13. Again, the lame duck year, they're pretty far below what their initial attendance market had been. Look at Atlanta. Atlanta drops below it immediately, never goes above it again in 13 seasons. Again, I chose 13 seasons for a reason. It's comparing apples to apples. What attendance was in Atlanta versus what it was in Milwaukee. Take a look at this. This is when Bud Selig bought the pilots, brought them to Milwaukee, right? It plummets first couple of years, but then year four, it goes above that 100% retention of their first year and stays above it. Look at this. Look at this spike up in attendance for the Milwaukee Brewers compared to what the other teams have done. Now, if you're a baseball scholar, you know why this dip took place. So I always ask anybody know why that baseball or that dip took place in year 12? Anybody? Strike. That was baseball strike 1981. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. It was a baseball strike. And then of course, 82 was the uh, year the Brewers went to the World Series. So what you see is that Milwaukee was not a bad baseball town. So blaming the fans to me is not a legitimate argument. Blaming greedy owners also is not an argument. What you will find by reading my book is there are at least four different groups of people you can lay it on. You can, you know, attempt to lay it on the fans if you want. You can attempt to lay it on Lou Perini. You can lay it on the new ownership group of the Braves, or you can lay it on the Milwaukee County Board. So I always ask anybody who's ever read my book, who's the bad guy in the story? Because every person I talk to has a different bad guy in the story. So that is my presentation, and I will take any questions you guys have. Patrick, thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I just looked it up. In uh, 2019, uh, the Brewers drew 2.9 million fans in Milwaukee. The Braves drew 2.6 million in Atlanta. Yeah. Well, you know, Milwaukee had for a lot of years, you know, um, if you look actually at the first 20 years that the Bre Brewers exist, so if you look from 1970 to 1990, in 18 of those years, the Milwaukee Brewers outdrew the Atlanta Braves. Um, so Milwaukee had always been a better baseball town. And I think the county board realized the mistake that they had made not locking the team into a long-term deal. Um, Grob, Eugene Grobschmidt actually was behind a bill um, to offer them a 25-year lease. So again, if you do your basic math in your head, 1970, 25 years out, it's 1995. That's right around the time Bud Selig's talking about we need a new stadium. Um, you know, they gave them the extension, um, you know, but it was a long-term deal. There's no way that they would have ever gotten a 25-year deal in the 1960s, but they realized the error of their ways by not locking a team long-term into a stadium deal uh, means that they can uh, back up and go away. The they was they um, and brain. it does become problematic. Question, questions or comments for Patrick? Can you, can you lean into your microphone? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Uh, questions or comments for Patrick? Yeah, and it, this is maybe more forward looking. You take a team like the Milwaukee Brewers and you kind of talk about a landlocked market. And, uh, you know, like if they brought a team to Green Bay, I mean, all of a sudden that would like pillage, I think, uh, you know, brewer, you know, brewer following. But what are the opportunities for a team like the Milwaukee Brewers if you're going to be faced in 25 years with, you know, potentially a, a, a major upgrade to a stadium? What, what are those revenue opportunities that are constraints well, are like a padlock market? The broadcasting that they have now, there are additional revenue streams that can carry um, uh, ball teams through. They're not as dependent in, as, as they were in the past on just butts in the, in the stands. So anytime somebody buys, I'm looking at, um, you know, Chuck's got a Cubs sweater on, right? Anytime you buy something that has, you know, an MLB sponsored logo, the clubs all get a percentage of that. Um, there's additional revenue streams that teams have now that they didn't have in the past. Where Bill Vec was right, Bill Vec made the argument, we need true revenue sharing in Major League Baseball. 
He's like, the American Football League had it. They understood that for all the teams to survive, you need a team in New York, but you need a team to survive in Kansas City as well. Same thing with Major League Baseball. In order for Major League Baseball to thrive, you need mid-market teams like St. Louis and Milwaukee and Seattle to, ha- to be able to compete every year. Because if it's just simply the Dodgers and the Yankees every year, fans quit watching. Fans quit coming out to games. Um, if you look at the American League revenue yeah. um, in the 1950s, when the, it seemed like every year the Yankees were going, fan attendance across the, the American League plummeted ahead of the National League. Very, it was very damaging in places like Kansas City, even sh- the Chicago White Sox, because fans, will, you know, why bother going out to a game when the Yankees already seem to have the pennant wrapped up by the you know first of June? So, you know, long term, you know, what does it mean for Milwaukee? You got to make sure that you got to make you you maintain the revenue streams. You have to be competitive. You cannot go into a twenty year losing cycle like they did under the Selig ownership group the last twenty years they were in Milwaukee. You got to find a way to win, to get into the post. And again, expanded playoffs helps a little bit. Um, that increases the revenue the teams get as well. But, you know, broadcasting is no longer necessarily seen as a geographical thing because you can be in Washington state and you can contract, you know, sign up to get Milwaukee Brewers baseball games. So we're no longer restricted that way at landlocked like they had been in the past. But again, it's always gonna be harder for teams like Milwaukee to survive and it will be for teams like the Mets or the Dodgers. This is true. I'd like to make a comment. Oh. Um, I'm, in, I'm at Rich Fronick's house. Okay. And uh, I remember going to Braves games in the 1950s with my dad. Um, and there were many games. There were people there from South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa was very common. Mm-hmm. And when the Twins... Uh, moved to Minneapolis, um, I think that hurt the Braves a lot. I mean, they lost all those states out west, plus they lost a big portion of the northwestern part of the state of Wisconsin. I mean, I, I went to school in Menominee at Stout, and um, there were all Twins fans. All uh, Twins were uh, big in Eau Claire. Uh, they, those people weren't driving down to Milwaukee anymore. Well, they, they asked in the court case that followed in 1966, the guy that was in charge of selling tickets actually did evaluate that because that question came up. And the Braves organization did not believe that the hit was as bad as what it seemed. Yes, yes. They said the percentage of tickets we sold out in Western Wisconsin was always minimal. Now, again, it hurts the radio revenue because with the twins coming in, it cut off the radio market in Minneapolis and out into the Dakotas. But they still had radio market in Iowa and it was competing with the twins and you had some of that market there. We still had, you know, the market up in the UP. Again, it's not a lot, but it was still something. Um, and again, a lot of the fans, like my dad grew up in Sparta, Wisconsin. Um, I asked, Dad, yeah, do you remember as a kid going to a Braves game? He said, yeah, we went a couple times. He's like, I couldn't tell you, you know, if we went to a couple games in a row. He's like, that was a long time ago. But my grandmother always loved the Braves out there, listened to them whenever she could. And when the Braves went to Atlanta, for her, it wasn't personal. Um, in the 1970s, I remember her watching on TBS because she had cable. She'd always put the Braves games on because she just remembered cheering for the Braves back in the day. Uh, but certainly the Twins going out there did have an impact. It's probably greater than what the numbers dictate. I don't know if, if it's as much as it anecdotally seems. Hi. Uh, Chuck had a question, I believe. Yeah, Patrick, I just wanted to ask you uh, two things. Uh, First of all, what happened to the minor league Milwaukee Brewers? Where did they go? They went to Toledo first. They did. And they became the Glass Sox for a couple of years. Then they moved to Wichita Falls and became the Wichita Falls Braves. And then they went into insolvency and disappeared. Okay. So there is no legacy of the old minor league Brewers left anymore. They're, they're gone, unfortunately. The other thing I wanted to ask you is I remember going to White Sox games in uh, County Stadium in 60, I think in 69. How much, uh, because of the support that Milwaukee did have and showing it was a baseball town, do you think that helped getting the uh, pilots to come in in 70? Well, it, it did. You know, hosting the games, um, the, the um, Brewers organization, people don't understand this, the Milwaukee Brewers Baseball Club actually incorporated in 1965. Yeah. With the idea that they were going to go out and find a team, buy it and move it to Milwaukee. And it was a lot of the same people that were in the team's organization that was trying to promote the Milwaukee Braves here. 
So when they sponsored games in 68 and 69, you know, the idea was to showcase that Milwaukee was still a good market. And they actually drew really well. It oh, wasn't yeah. like, you know, 1953 numbers, but they were drawn more than they were at Comiskey to the point that um, the Allen brothers seriously considered either moving the team or selling the team to Selig and moving the team from the south side to Milwaukee County. Um, one of the other options that was actually floated, and Phil Wrigley um, debated this a little bit, um, because if you remember, obviously Wrigley Field didn't have lights. Yeah. And as we were moving more into a televised era and primetime games, et cetera, the thought was that the Cubs would play day games in Chicago and they would play their night games up at County Stadium. Now, can you imagine if that would have happened where the Cubs actually split between Chicago and Milwaukee? I mean, boy, talk about, you know, upsetting the apple cart, you know, for a lot of Cubs fans. Now you just don't realize that that was even a possibility. But, you know, those exhibition games certainly did help prove. Now, the problem was Major League Baseball was still very angry as an institution at Milwaukee. It's why they bypass them for expansion. There's no reason why, if you're looking to expand baseball, that you put a team in Seattle on sketchy financing in a minor league ballpark with the promise that they're going to put improvements in that ballpark and then turn around and build a dome stadium when you've got a perfectly valid county stadium with a proven sales team and a proven track record of attendance um it made no sense and think of the teams think of the cities they put teams into they bypassed milwaukee for san diego for seattle for montreal right well it turns out because guys like um walter o'malley and bill bartholomew were fighting against ever having baseball come back to milwaukee they were so embittered by what happened in Milwaukee. They wanted to make sure Milwaukee never got another team. Thank God for Bud Selig that he was that determined to make sure baseball came back. So. Very good. Patrick. Other questions? Uh, Patrick, I have a uh, kind yeah. of a question, and I and you may have uh, hit on it on your last when you the way you answered. Uh, I graduated from from uh, high school in 1965, mm -hmm. and I I think there was some sort of promotion for the last year, and I think it was 19, 1965, on opening day, that if they sold out on opening day, the money would be go to the to the uh, Milwaukee Brewers or? To, to Teams Incorporated, yes. Yeah, okay. It would go to Teams that, Incorporated. So what happened was, yeah, the, the Braves organization did zero promotions in 65. And, you know, you think of all the local advertisers. So, again, you think back in the day, right, you go into a bank, there'd be a stack of schedules, right? You grab a schedule, you put it up on your – they didn't do any of that stuff, right? There was yeah. no promotion. Splits withdraws their radio sponsorship, right? It, it's a debacle waiting to happen. So Teams Incorporated caught a deal because the Braves ownership group realized we can't afford to lose $3 million in a year. We've got all this money to pay off starting in 1967. We need to get revenues now. So they told Teams Incorporated, if you sell out, you will get a percentage. It was, you know, a nickels on the dollar, but it was at least enough that there would be revenue there that they could do something either to promote the team here, promote baseball in Milwaukee, or maybe have a chance to buy a franchise down the road. Um, Unfortunately, there was a lot of people very bitter and angry that the team was leaving. I asked my kids, you know, uh, who know me very well, and I said, what do you think I would do? And both my kids, without even missing a beat, said, Dad, you probably would not have gone to a game that year. You'd have been so angry they were leaving, you probably wouldn't have gone. I, I went to that, that opening day. I went, uh, you know, a friend and I went there, and it was a sellout, and it was a great time. But I, I just still remember that. And I, I think, you know, when you talked about the four uh, – groups that people say, why did this happen? Um, growing up at that, in that time period, um, we still had bitter, my dad uh, had bitter feelings for Perini and even the, just the way he sold the team and, and so forth. And, and the, the, there was a, uh, when the field was, the county stadium was built, there was pine trees out in center field and they call that Perini woods and, and, that was not not in kind words. Was that referred to as Perini Woods? It was kind of a derogatory. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and again, you know, you know, that's why I say, you know, it's hard to look at Perini, you know, as a whole, and you know, determine whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. Because without Lou Perini, the Braves don't come. Without the right. Braves coming, we don't have Major League Baseball here. We just yeah. don't. I um, I don't 
I don't think we, it was really the county, county is the one in my mind now is the one that uh, they, they wrecked a good thing. So, yeah. And again, it was, you know, I hate using the expression, it was a perfect storm, but you got three things that are really going on. You got baseball attendance in decline everywhere, yeah. everywhere, not just Milwaukee, everywhere. Interest in baseball is dropping. So you got that, that's problem number one. You've got a county board that wants to maximize returns in the stadium. And again, they're looking at the taxpayers, right? These guys have to stand for election. They have to stand in front of the voters and say, hey, I'm doing what I can. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to finance or bankroll Major League Baseball, right? It should be able to stand on its own. So therefore, you know, we're going to maximize these revenues. They, they felt every bit entitled to do that. But, you know, that's the second part. The third part is you've got an unlimited revenue stream in Atlanta that you just simply can't compete with. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's other things that are going on as well, but you know, those, those are really some tough decisions. And you had poor leadership, frankly. Um, and I, I always say, as with all due respect to anybody who knew the men that were in charge of the county at the time, we, we had poor leadership. John Doyne and um, Eugene Grobschmidt spent more time fighting each other than doing anything to make sure the Braves were safe. Yeah. You had Henry Meyer in Milwaukee, who was not a baseball fan in any way, shape, or form. He'd show up at a game if he got three tickets. He'd maybe throw out a first pitch. He'd be there for a couple innings. He'd leave. He had zero interest in it. So you just you got this perfect storm of terrible people in regards to dealing with the team. Now they might be nice people in their own, you know, melee or with their family or doing their other things, but when you needed decisive leadership in the county, there was none. Got it. There was none. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, say that uh, my mom's favorite player was Eddie Matthews and my favorite player was Henry Aaron. So yeah. <laughs> we're, we're thinking alike. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, my mom's was, was Eddie Matthews and growing up yeah. Hank Aaron was my favorite player. Yeah. I just wanted to be Hank yeah. Aaron when I was a kid. Yeah. So unfortunately I couldn't hit a fastball like he could. Yeah. Great. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Patrick. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is Alan. Go ahead, Hello. Alan. I, I have a quick comment uh, aside. This is a story. A friend of mine who grew up in Milwaukee still lives there. As a fifth grader, he and his buddy hear that Joe Adcock lives in a neighborhood near them. So they wander over, find his house, knock on the door. His wife comes holding a baby and they ask. And she said, yeah, he, just stay here for a minute. He's in the shower. So a few minutes later, he comes out with a towel wrapped around him, talks to him, gives him an autograph. That's great. My, my, my aunt grew up um, in a neighborhood uh, nearby Lou Burdett's house. So she said as a neighborhood, you know, as, even as a girl growing up in that neighborhood, Burdett would come out and play catch with him. How cool is that? You know? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just, again, it's, it's a different time, you know? Um, you know, with the Milwaukee Braves story, if everything else were the same and the team moved here now, if we never had been, you know, no, because you look at the salaries baseball players make and just there's, you know, Eddie Matthews liked to cut his own lawn. He's just, one of the negatives was, you know, when the kids always wanted to go over there and cut his lawn for him, sometimes he just wanted to have a beer and go cut his own lawn and it was already done. You know, these were guys that were just like the people in the community. They fit, you know, people talk about the connection the Brooklyn fans had with the Dodgers, you know, that. Oh, it was great for the community, the people that played for the team, you know, Gil Hodges and, you know, pray for Gil Hodges in the World Series and 50, all this other stuff, right? I'm telling you, every bit of that is true about the Milwaukee Braves in the community they lived. They were beloved here, not because they were a winning team. They were beloved here because they seemed to fit the community well. And that's why they were beloved. Sounds good. Uh, I think that probably summed up our comments tonight. Patrick, again, great job. Great memories. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing everybody in September. All right. Thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it for interest in the book against uh, Home of the Braves. So um, it goes into a lot more detail of things I talked about tonight, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed the talk. I appreciated the time and the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.